While some believe that our universe is of no more consequence than a single atom in a solar system, others suppose that innumerable universes exist, each with their own intelligent life, their own model of reality, and their own laws of nature. With so much on offer, perhaps we should consider the possibility of a universe with only two dimensions, or one with twenty, or a cosmos in which the past, present and future all exist at once. Something as fanciful as a universe where inhabitants exist as multiple entities simultaneously and travel between the worlds is instantaneous. Places on the other side of the Big Bang, where all the clocks run backwards and ruined castles rebuild themselves. I think there are far stranger things than anything human mathematicians or astrophysicists have come to dream of. When I try to expand my mind to visualise the infinite possibilities, it brings me right back to the two most important atoms, the two that bind us together in the single molecule of a relationship. This journey is about some of those relationships, and another universe, a very real place where the unholy houses of our worries have roses round the door, and every good strand in our life is a creeping stone bramble. It's only complicated when they talk about it on the TV. You don't need a degree in astrophysics to understand it. Eternity, that is. Once you accept there are multiple universes, you agree that the possibilities out there in space go on forever. And, if there's an infinite number of possibilities, anything is possible, no matter how slim the odds. That means that somewhere out there in the blueness of forever, there's another universe just like ours, and whirling around inside that one, lots of stars, which are just like our sun with other planets going around them, just like ours. And, by an incredible series of coincidences, one of them has developed in virtually the same way as our own Earth, right down to the tiniest detail. Many times I'd wondered just how much there was to know. Many became a number that continued to grow, until I asked myself, what if there are terrestrial life forms living on these other Earths? And if there are things out there in the vast darkness of infinity, are they intelligent? Are they friendly? Do they eat, sleep, gamble, steal and drink? Do they love? Do they pray to a god? And of course, what would they look like? Here in this ocean of ours, there are fish that you could easily mistake for patches of sand or pieces of coral, until one of them skips right out from under your nose. Astrobiologists have told us that life doesn't have to consist of bipeds that move and breathe and smoke their cigarettes like we do, but that the universe is a gigantic bell jar of possibility, where everything has the chance and the right to happen. So I never had any cut and dried theories regarding just how other life should look. I just had this feeling that one day life would surprise us. That some day an unfamiliar civilization would stop by to meet us, or we might accidentally bump into E.T. on some quiet back corridor in space. Being interested in science, I believed in the power of the eye in the sky and the star man, and the myth, the story about the man with the name Pax, who loved and prayed and then lost his lover, so set off to the end of the universe, to try to find her. In the late 21st century, the most powerful and ambitious planet hunter was named after Pax. It set off from the Cape with its own giant eyeglass, seeking new worlds and life beyond our bubble. The challenge? To find a planet that orbited a star similar to our own sun. This planet would ideally be about the third or fourth rock from its host star, orbiting once every 300 days or so, and floating around in a region, without too much steam and without too much ice, that perfect spot we call the Goldilocks region. 
We are told that scientists have never discovered an organism capable of surviving without water. So Pax, guided by man's priority quest to find wet planets, began by taking a small snapshot in the Cygnus region of our own Milky Way. Suddenly, we were watching a million new suns. On the 5th of December, by photographing planets that blocked out the light from their host star, in the same way that a moth blocks out the light from a candle, Pax found the first wet candidate, a planet in orbit of a G-type star, once every 289 days. The temperature on this planet was similar to that of our own Earth, but it was two and a half times bigger, more like a Jupiter or a Uranus. Since the water was no different to ours, and the gravity was about the same, Pax turned his telescope closer to the planet's surface and peered through the dense clouded gas. What he saw was a whole ecosystem living below the ocean. It was certainly a planet covered in water, but devoid of any solid ocean floor a pearl without a home, a planet in all but substance, a water world set adrift in an empty sky. During the first six weeks of Pax's voyage, seven new planets were found. In its first year, there were 700. They ranged in size from half as big as our Earth till several times the size of Jupiter. Some were our vision of hell, churning oceans of molten rock and mountains of bronze, seven times taller than anything on earth. Blowtorch worlds with two mornings and two evenings, landscapes of double rainbows populated by the twisted tall timber of static tornadoes. On the other hand, there were planets small and close enough to their host star to be rocky with liquid water mile-high mountains, deserts, colourful jungles and quiet utopic wetlands. Astrobiologists were soon to confirm that the universe was alive with the type of planets where evolution had solved the common problems caused by the environment and had converged on a solution that had seen three different species evolve in the same way. A member of the elephant family, a member of the bird family, and a fish, which had all developed the prickly spines and snout of a hedgehog. A place where the hunters and the hunted had driven evolution, and fierce giant rodents with the armoured shell of a military tank inhabited a world that had endured twenty ice ages in the last thousand years. A home to some of the greatest giants of them all, where colossal Ice Age leviathans swallow two tons of animals a week, and a 30-foot-high woolly mammoth stumbles around her kitchen sink hovel. Places where vast, verdant valleys and prairies roll out to the seas, and mythical beings are commonplace. A land with a total of three million new species of insects and animals, each endowed with reason and enough of them to repopulate every extinct creature on Earth. Now, the Western Equus, Noah's fabled water horse, lives in the land where Jonah's land whale grazes on airborne particle matter. Fan-like plants collect infrared light by spinning like whirling umbrellas. Yellow phosphorescent fish, with a sting that would really spoil your holiday, swim in a fusion of psychedelic colours. Green reptiles and mysterious golden amphibians love with more passion and tenderness than any mammal. And they each have their own startling pasts, tales of triumph and disaster, and explode gloriously into bustling colonies and harmonise altogether in cold blood. Each new planet that Pax discovered had its own unique mix of flora and fauna, its own fingerprint, its own DNA. The scientists continued to explore with increasing forensic scrutiny, 
Landing parties discovered towering walls and spires and the ruins abandoned by ancient civilizations. And just when we thought they couldn't find anything more incredible, they blew our mind. Scientists had discovered over a hundred billion exoplanets. They'd calculated that there were a million planets whose inhabitants were light years ahead of us, where they shifted shape and travelled around from dimension to dimension using the second power of quadratics. There were a million or so planets that were light years behind us, whose tribes still lived in the Dark Ages and played with fire whilst trying to work out how far their new invention, the wheel, might take them. There was a whole galaxy of planets that were at various stages of evolution, whose inhabitants were looking back at us whilst making the same bold statements, stacked to the teeth with mathematical evidence, and convinced that somewhere on one of those other planets they all had an exact double, that there was another one of them, in the same way that there's another you, and an infinite number of variations of them and you. Strange to say, as statistics will have it, on these other planets, anything that could possibly happen to your other you will happen. It's perfectly true that on another planet right now, there is another you, who's probably a rock and roll star and leans back pressing gas through the winding lanes of a private island, whilst listening to their own songs power played on the radio with the tints fully closed, because the paparazzi won't leave them alone. I'm clicking my fingers for you to wake up, because in the neighbouring galaxy, your other you's music career didn't take off. They hit the bottle, and will sing on street corners for metal money. It's all very sad. I should mention in passing that I was that guy, the one who had been drinking from a bottle and was about to sing on a street corner. I ran into a few problems and realised that I needed to make a change, and quickly. I have since found, as with all acts of initiative, there seems to be one elementary truth. The moment we absolutely commit ourselves to change, providence moves too. All sorts of things seem to occur to help you, things that would otherwise never have happened. All sorts of unexplained events and characters seem to turn up just to help things along. Very soon after my fall from grace, unfamiliar civilizations began firing powerful laser messages through their own giant telescopes to announce their existence. Fast bursts of signals that were being intercepted after a journey of a thousand light years. Earth began receiving a constant flood of data, signals that were so unambiguously artificial they could only have come from faraway worlds. Communication experts more used to working on the intelligence of chimpanzees and dolphins began trying to devise some ways of decoding the messages to frame some kind of response. Others believed that a new level of code breaking was required, as the standard decipherment and decryption techniques used by the military and security agencies didn't seem to be helping much. The government put things into context by announcing that they still had extraterrestrial scripts and signals from antiquity that have remained undeciphered over hundreds of years. Still they came, quick bright flashes that lasted just milliseconds, but gave out as much energy as our sun in a single day. The PAX team became very interested in one particular planetary system. This was similar in scale to our own solar system and orbited the star HD 162826, a hundred light years from Earth in the constellation of Hercules, a star born from the same cloud of gas as our own Sun. It was noted that the first planet of the star was similar in appearance to our own Jupiter, being only slightly smaller 
and completing its eccentric orbit every 420 days. The project scientists had to double-check that what they were seeing was actually true. The big telescope blinked, ground control ran a check on its coordinates and slewed its beady eye back in the planet's direction to confirm that the planet did indeed have liquid water on board. It certainly did. It had life in the sea, sky and on land. It had a hot side where the heat rose and a dark side where the heat sank back into the cold. A permanent wind system, a stable atmosphere and a climate, the type of weather you could forecast. And this new purple dot was in the region of two red dwarfs, so it was never quite sunset there. Every hour was a cocktail hour, a good spot for real estate, or so I thought. When I looked closely, its formation of continents mirrored almost exactly that of our own. The hazy images of the planet sent back by Pax brought me right back to myself, and I found that once I made a start on trying to take the first step of the journey to get there, the universe took her own steps to help me. And if you're prepared to listen, I will explain how. But first, I think it's only fair that you should know a little bit more about me and the circumstances under which I became interested in the most recent news reports about this perfect getaway. 